Welcome to another episode of Purchase Two Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today it started investing in 2001 and purchased his first 12 unit property in 2008. He's raised over $7 million and has bought and sold more than 450 residential units. Brian Hamrick is the past president of the West Michigan Rental Property Owners Association. Brian, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Seth. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're really looking forward to this. So uh, to kick things off, tell us about your real estate goals right now. My real estate goals at the moment, uh, well, to tell you where, where I am now, I should probably yeah. tell you where I've been. I've been in the multifamily residential. That's, that's really my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2015, I stopped buying uh, multifamily and apartments because the market here in Grand Rapids, uh, just like a lot of markets across the country, has just gotten too hot, too much competition. And uh, I like to be where other people are not. So I started looking for other asset classes to invest in. Yeah, Not that I won't invest in multifamily and apartments again, but I just haven't seen those opportunities. So I've been looking at self-storage. Uh, we purchased a self-storage facility about a year ago. Uh, love the numbers on self-storage. Love the difference in, in, in how easy it is compared to multifamily and apartments. Yeah. And uh, also the other asset class I've really been looking at and, and investing in is non-performing and performing notes, which is something else I really love. Yeah. So, so in terms of what you're looking to do, you know, later on this year and over the next couple of years, are you just looking to expand your holdings and you know, the, the, that note section and, um, and the self storage? Yeah, yes. So what I do typically is I raise money from high net worth investors who want to invest in alternative assets, what would be considered alternative asset yeah. classes, you know, commercial multifamily apartments, uh, that's to me, or to a lot of investors, that's an alternative type of investment. Um, and I then partner with strategic partners. Uh, I have a strategic partner in multifamily. I have a strategic partner in self-storage. And I have a strategic partner in non-performing notes. So the goal, to get back to your question about my goals, uh, my goals are to, um, we have some uh, land under contract. We're going to be doing ground up construction on a self-storage facility. Uh, just south of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, we, we're also looking at some other locations where we can do the same thing uh, and, and acquire existing. So one of my goals is to expand that branch of my investing portfolio. Yeah. Uh, I'm continuing to expand in the non-performing notes world as well, uh, going after larger pools. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get too much into non-performing notes, but the, the more money you have to buy uh, multiple assets, the better discounts you can get on them. Yeah. So, so that's my goal is just, just to kind of continue expanding in those different asset classes. Yeah. And, and when you made the switch from multifamily to the notes and self-storage, what changes did you have to make about how you thought about the asset? Because you're, even though it's still real estate, um, it's, it's a different type of real estate. So um, what changes did you have to make in terms of how you thought about it? Well, th there's definitely a difference in expectations because with multifamily and apartments, you have a lot more expenses on your, your line items, you know, plumbing, electric, more maintenance, turnover costs. When it came to self-storage, a lot of those just don't exist because you're dealing with what are, if they're outdoor units, you're dealing with metal buildings that when, it, when a tenant moves out, you can just sweep it clean. Yeah. Uh, so just kind of wrapping my head around the fact that we don't have those expenses and the, you know, the management costs, because we use a virtual management system and online software uh, are a lot less as well. So um, that was one adjustment is just because I'm a numbers person. I like to understand the numbers. I like to see the numbers in bullet time. You think of the movie, The Matrix, that, yeah. you know, you want to see them coming at you in slow motion. So, you know, <laughs> exactly. That's how I like to see my numbers. So when I was first looking at the numbers on self-storage, uh, I'm like, well, wait, there's got to be something wrong here because uh, I'm not seeing all the numbers I'm used to. Well, that's because uh, you don't have people actually living in your self-storage units. 
when it came to non-performing notes, it's the same thing. It's like understanding the fact that we're not, but when you buy a note, you're not buying the, the physical property. You're buying the paper, which uh, is a contract for that person who lives in that property to, to pay you um, so that they can continue owning that property. And there again, the numbers are completely different. Yeah. So, so that was the big, the big mind shift was just going from the numbers that I was very accustomed to on, on multifamily to the other asset classes. Yeah. And, and when you're going after the, the self storage with multifamily, m- almost all of the guests on the show, uh, go look for a value add opportunity. Does the same apply when you're looking at a self storage facility? Yeah. So with our self storage facility, it was a complete value add opportunity. Um, it was a very well run facility when we bought it. We bought it at the beginning of 2018, January 2018. Uh, Mom and pop owned. Uh, they did not have an online presence uh, that was that where you could go online and actually rent a unit. Uh, they didn't really have a real website, but they were 100% occupied. And uh, every month they w- they had 180 units, so they would fill out 180 invoices and put stamps on them and mail them off. So we looked at that and, and the upside to us was, well, they've done a great job with this facility. Um, they're making money, but we knew we could go in, we could increase rents because they were below market. They weren't pushing the market rents. And we knew that we could make the, the management side more efficient through a, like an online presence, a website uh, where we wouldn't have to have someone on site eight hours a day, we could have someone come maybe four to eight hours a week to, to just take care of things. And in doing that, you know, we, we bought the facility, I believe our purchase price was about 1.3 million. And we're in the process of uh, expanding it. That was the other part of the upside opportunity was um, there's an office building there, a 3,000 square foot office building, plus a pole barn uh, that we're going to tear down. And we're going to put up 15,000 square foot more of self-storage space. So, uh, and, you know, increasing our, the value by the time we're done and we've added this additional 15,000 square foot and we have that leased up, the value will be over $3 million. Nice. And this is something we paid 1.3 million for. Nice. And, and you had mentioned that uh, you have strategic partners in the different, in the different uh, asset classes. Um, what sort of things do you look for um, in a strategic partner? Um, you know, if, if let, let's say you didn't have anybody in multifamily, let's say, what sort of check boxes do you need to uh, hit uh, to feel comfortable with that relationship? Someone who's not afraid to, to take the reins and really drive a deal forward. Um, I'm very good at coming in, raising the money, kind of looking at the overall picture of how the deal should be structured, how we can make it happen, you know, bringing the vision as to, okay, here's how we'll make it happen. Yeah. Um, With the, the, the multifamily, uh, my strategic partner there, uh, I partnered, sorry, uh, I partnered with a, uh, uh, someone who was in the business and owned his own property management company. And once we realized that we would work well together, we said, well, let's actually go after some of these larger apartment communities and purchase them. So I, there, there I wanted someone who had the knowledge of how to deal with the management side, the physical operation of the property. I do the asset management, so I oversee the investment. They oversee the, the actual physical property. With the self-storage, my partner there, um, he found the deal. And brought it to me. So right there, he's the perfect partner because he brought yeah. me a deal. I look at, I, you know, 99% of the deals I look at, uh, I don't spend more than three minutes on. But he brought me this deal. And after three minutes, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. I can see that this is going to make a lot of money. So um, I partnered with him on it, brought in the money. We made it happen. And he's been a great partner just because he's, he's on top of things. He's handling the management side of the, the facility. He's the, he, he's new to the business, um, but he had done enough training and had enough, uh, a mentorship and network so that any problems that came up, he was able to answer. Um, my, my other partner in the non-performing notes, he's been around for a while. 
So what I like about him is he's been through the ups and downs. Um, in the 90s, during the savings and loans crisis, you know, he lost some money then. Uh, the l- latest Great Recession hit him pretty hard. So he, he knows uh, how things can go wrong. And I, I like that because I want to be very conservative and I want my partners to be very conservative. Plus, uh, my, my, the partner, Gene, who I'm partnering with on notes, he also knows that business inside and out. He has like a special algorithm in his head every time he looks at a different uh, asset or note scenario, you know, how, what's, what's, he can see it from A to Z. How are we going to acquire it? What's he going to negotiate it down to? What are the, the profit opportunities? Do we hold that note and get it reperforming with the, the homeowner, keep them in their home? Do we um, give them cash for keys? Do we let it go to share of sale and foreclosure and just let it sell there? You know, he can see all the different possibilities. He's like Dr. Strange in Infinity War. You know, his head's yeah. spinning around and he's like, okay, I can see all the million possibilities. Here's the one that we're going to go with. Yeah, that's a smart guy to have on your team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. yeah, and and one of the questions I get asked all the time by our listeners is, you know, how do I get the capital? And you are a capital raising pro. Uh, so do you have any tips for, let's say somebody, uh, they own a, a handful of properties and they're looking to grow. Um, what tips would you give them to go out and start raising some outside capital? Boy, it's, it's all about networking. It's all about networking. And we, a lot of times it's about partnering too. You, 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 know, you have to be willing to give up part of your, your deal. Part of, part of your pie yeah. to, to bring in that money. Um, every time, well, with the multifamily, I partnered with, with uh, Marty Green, who, who owns his own management company. He, he knew that world. Um, he was able, we, we were able to raise, raise a lot of money, but we needed some bigger chunks of money at times. And he knew who to go to. And we gave them a piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I say give them a piece of the pie, they get some equity in the deal. So you can't be selfish and try to hoard all that equity for yourself. If you want to go bigger, you're going to have to partner, you're going to have to bring people into your deal, but you also know how to, you have to know how to talk to those people when you want to bring them into the deal. Um, You have to know how to present the story of what, and and the opportunity and the upside that the deal represents. And you have to be convincing. You have to believe in your deal. So I don't bring anything to my investors or to potential investors that I don't believe in 100%. You know, there's no guarantees. I always tell them you could lose all the money that you invest, yeah. um, but I wouldn't be bringing it to them in the first place if I didn't think that we could meet our targets. Yeah, and I think those are some really good points. And especially, you know, in, in the capital raising space, it's all about communicating. But it's communicating is almost everything I, I found, you know, you listen a lot, you talk a whole lot less and, uh, and, and you really find out what's driving that, that uh, investor. I like what you just said. You listen, you, you talk, you, you listen a lot to what the other person is saying. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's not just me telling the story and trying to convince them. It's me listening to them and picking up on where their objections might be and, and what I need to be more clear about. Yeah, oh, for, for sure. So have, have you developed any uh, routines or rituals, um, you know, in the span of your career that have helped keep your focus on your business? The, you know, I think that um, probably the, the most important thing is me sitting down in front of an Excel spreadsheet and just charting out the numbers. Uh, I'm doing that right now on a particular opportunity that I'm looking at. Just kind of, you know, I, I like, uh, I, ha- I, for the multifamily and a lot of my investments, I have a, a software that I purchased. I paid a hundred dollars for it and it's a great uh, financial analysis software. Um, but I like to kind of break it down myself as well. It's kind of like doing my homework. So I, I run different scenarios in Excel. That's to me probably the mo- one of the most important routines is just, putting the numbers down on paper in front of you using Excel or whatever uh, you, you use so that you can kind of get your arms around where the numbers fall and whether a, a deal makes sense. And I, and I highly recommend if you're investing in real estate, you purchase a, a real uh, financial analysis software tool. 
Yeah. And, and like you said, there's a whole bunch for a hundred bucks or less. Like it's not like you're going to break the bank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's some very good ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know we touched on a little bit on that self storage deal. Um, I'm not sure if that one was, uh, was going to be the, the keystone deal, but is there a keystone deal that made a big impact on you and your business? Yeah. So I, um, you know, you, you mentioned in my bio that in 2008, I bought a 12 unit and in 2009, we bought a 37 unit. Nice. And, and of course, 2009 was a you know, great recession. It was a buyer's market. But I teach a class for the RPOA on financial analysis. And this is one of the examples I always use. So when I knew I, I had to have an example ready, I thought, well, I've already done a PowerPoint on this one. So, yeah. so I have the numbers right in front of me. Great. Um, how, how do you like to proceed? You want me to just kind of take you through it? Yeah. So t tell us the story about the property, how you sourced it, uh, what you saw in the property uh, to cause you to act on it. So uh, this is a property that is probably about 15 minutes from where I live. That was important to me. I, was, I, I buy, when it comes to multifamily and apartments, I'm buying in my own backyard. Uh, just because the management part is so intense, I, I like to be able to drive by and see it if there's any problems. Um, uh, what, what did I see about it? Well, I knew I wanted to go bigger. I wanted that economy of scale. I started off early on in 2001 in single families and condos. Um, by 2008, I realized, okay, you need the economy of scale. That's why we bought the 12 unit. That's why we bought the 37 unit. Now, uh, it was, again, it was a buyer's market. It was 37 units that were uh, listed for $650,000. This was a short sale. So I recognized that it was a bargain. Um, the, uh, the income, and I've, I do have the numbers here, so I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. Um, the income in 2008, the previous 12 months was about $200,000. The expenses uh, were about 136,000. So the net operating income was $64,600, right, right around that area. Okay. Uh, we knew we could get this at a 10 cap. And have you talked about cap rates on your show? A, a, a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, most people won't even recognize a 10 cap these days. No, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I feel uh, guilty uh, even saying that. But uh, yeah, 10 cap, basically, a, a cap rate is basically the, the rate of return you would expect on a particular property in a particular neighborhood if you were to pay all cash. So if we were to pay all cash, for this, this property based on its net operating income, which is about si almost $65,000, and we wanted a 10% return, we would pay $650,000 for that. Now, this was a short sale. The, pre the owners were doc out-of-state doctors. It was like three doctors who lived in Utah or Nevada. They had purchased it for well over a million dollars several years earlier going into the Great Recession. When people were paying crazy money, banks were lending crazy money. And I, I just could not for the life of me figure out how they expected to even pay their, their mortgage uh, based on the debt service they had for paying over a million dollars because they just weren't bringing in the income. And the problem they had run into is they, they weren't making enough money. So the first thing they did was they fired their property management company because it's always the property management company's fault, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, that's when things start to go downhill because they, they hired someone uh, off of Craigslist who actually was, was pretty good. We really liked her and wanted to keep her on the team. Um, but she was a one-man show ma managing 37 units and she had a full-time job somewhere else. So you can imagine how things would, would, could, would spiral out of control pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, that's why this property was being sold as a short sale and we got it under contract for $650,000, did our physical inspection and due diligence and realized that there were some major problems, major uh, mechanicals uh, that would need to be replaced, HVAC systems, uh, hot water boilers, uh, roofs, <laughs> things like that. So we actually ended up buying it for $600,000. Nice. Uh, we were able, it, it through a local bank, and it, at that time, you have to remember, back at that time, people think, oh, there were so many bargains. You could just buy things at, at a fire sale price. But the problem was, 
it was very hard to get loans because banks had, were all panicking and they weren't lending money. So we lucked out because we found a bank that because of this area, it was kind of a, a, a C area, low income area. They were able to get community reinvestment credits nice. by loaning on this property. Uh, and they were also able to loan us an additional $200,000 to put into rehabbing this property. And that $200,000 ended up um, paying for new roofs, all new windows, uh, new insulation, um, new siding, uh, some mechanicals we had identified. Uh, the building's a hodgepodge. There's actually three buildings plus a duplex. And the buildings were all hodgepodge of some of the heat was, uh, was electric baseboard heat. Some of the heat was hot water uh, boiler heat. And uh, we probably had at least $80,000 in new mechanical equipment that we had to purchase uh, to replace yeah. the obsolete equipment. So in doing that, we were able to, after about 18 months of, uh, hemorrhaging money because <laughs> you're just constantly putting money back into these properties when you buy them in that condition. But uh, I had hired a, a professional property management company. Actually, it was a, a company that had uh, helped me find the property in the first place. They just by operating professionally and sending out notices when people don't pay and following through on the eviction process uh, and getting rid of the tenants that we didn't want there any longer. Um, cause there was, uh, drugs being sold, prostitution. Um, there, there were things we found out after we bought it that, uh, uh, might've given us a little bit more concern, uh, going in, but, um, they were able to clean it up, get better tenants in there. Um, this is a low income property. So we do have section eight tenants. We work with other, uh, Christian organizations and refugee organizations. Um, but we, but that doesn't mean that it's a, um, you know, it has to be a D property. I would consider this to be a C plus property. Yeah. And, and now, uh, oh, the, the other thing, the big thing we did was there was a duplex. I, I mentioned there were three buildings plus a duplex. Well, the duplex was empty and it needed about $20,000 in rehab to uh, fix it up and make it habitable. Uh, by doing that and going back to cap rates, I always teach this in the class. So anytime you add a dollar, to your net operating income. Um, the rule of thumb is you're adding about $10 in value to the property. And that's based on a 10 cap. Yeah. So if it's a five cap, you're actually adding $20 in value to the property based off the $1 that you, you're adading to the net operating income. Yeah, and, oh, and I'll, I'll just jump in. If anybody's yeah, looking to uh, calculate this, all you do is you take that dollar and you divide it by the cap rate, uh, the market cap that you're using, it, just in case somebody wants to do it uh, on their own at home. Yeah, it, it pays to understand how these properties are valued through the net. It's the income method. Yeah. You're basically taking your net operating income, which is your uh, what what's left after you collect all your income and pay all your expenses, uh, not including your debt service, but you, that's your net operating income, and you divide that by the cap rate, okay. and and that will pretty accurately in commercial properties in commercial properties tell you the value of the the property. Yeah. And commercial properties are five units or more. Now, if you don't understand what I just said, uh, it pays to, to get some training. So you do understand it because that's, that's the kind of math that leads to making lots of money. Oh, for, for sure. We, we've got some instructional videos on the channel too, in, in case anybody's uh, uh, looking for that. So sorry. Yeah. What, do you, do you talk about that on your channel? Yeah, we, we've got, we go over all the different valuation methods and all that stuff. So, um, Go, go to the channel and uh, you'll find those videos. But sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, no, I love the organic plugs. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah. check it out. If you have that material, um, yeah. I'd highly recommend people uh, check it out. So anyway, um, oh, going back to the duplex. Um, tw so we invested $20,000 to rehab it, get it up and running. You know, our, our income from that duplex is over $9,000 a year. Uh, between the two sides and the, the income that we're getting. So that $9,000 added at, on a, based on a 10 cap, $90,000 in value to the property. Yeah. So a $20,000 investment yields a $90,000 return. That's a pretty good investment. Oh, and right. that's how you make money in this, yeah. in this world, uh, in, in this multifamily uh, commercial apartment world.
Yeah, that, that's great. And when you were, um, when you were closing on the property, um, how leveraged were you? Just because, you know, it sounded like this property had some distress to it. Were you going in with, you know, let's say 40% equity, 50% based on the lending environment? We were able to get a 75% loan to value. Oh, really? Loan. Oh, that's great. And the 200,000 was on top of that. So our nice. total, and I, I had one partner in the deal with me, our total investment out of pocket was $150,000. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So we, we, we refied probably about four, it was a five year balloon loan. So we refied within five years. Um, I think, I believe the value had gone up to about 1.1 million at that time. And, and this was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, because of the value that we had added to it. And, and uh, so we got all of our money back out and so what that means is any money that we make going forward from cash flow or refinance, it's, it, it's an infinite return because we don't have any money in this deal anymore. Yeah. That's a great deal. I'm so glad you brought that one up. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's a great, that, that's a good one. Um, you know, our net operating income now has gone up to uh, well over $140,000. Nice. So you, you can pick your cap rate. Right now, where, where we are in the market, I'm sure we could sell it for at least an eight, probably a seven cap rate. Yeah, oh, that, that, that's great. I always love hearing about those deals because they're just you know home runs, and now you're on the gravy train. Yeah, that, that's about that, and that's going back to goals. That is the goal: is to to have those assets that you can hold long term uh, and collect passive cash flow from them. Uh, yeah. The amount of time I spend on this property is maybe a half hour a month. And that's just looking at the numbers. Yeah. Maybe once a, once a year I'll go and we'll do an inspection and walk around the property and, yeah. uh, and make sure it's in, in great shape. And I'll drive by it and you know, make sure that there's not, um, that I'll make sure it's still there and it still yeah. looks good. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty much a passive investment at this point. Yeah. And we're collecting great cash flow. Oh, that's great. So how has getting into real estate changed your life so far? Uh, well, just that way. Uh, I've yeah. been able to leave my full-time job. I, I had a great job uh, that I was doing for 20 years. Uh, I was doing it in Los Angeles, moved to Michigan. I was working remotely. And about five or six years ago, I, I managed to just leave that job. And it was funny. I didn't it was the kind of job where they would call me and give me projects to work on. Um, and at some point I stopped calling them for work and they stopped calling me. <laughs> so I, I never quit. They, they never fired me. It just kind of stopped. And, uh, but it was perfect timing because I had enough uh, deals under my belt, enough passive cash flow coming in, um, not quite to replace the income that I was giving up, but to keep me and my family, you know, in clothes and food. Uh, while I uh, did other syndications, raised more money through um, you know, syndicating, refinancing, acquisition fees, and 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 uh, you know to a point now where where um, uh, I don't have I don't ever have to think about going back to a job. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm you know I can just go to the Bahamas and and, and not do anything. I, I I do need to keep working on the real estate, but I don't need to worry about going yeah. back to a job. Yeah. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, that's great. So, uh, Brian, if somebody's, you've got your podcast, um, if somebody's looking to find you, where can they uh, get you online? Yeah. Thanks, Seth. Uh, you can find me at higinvestor.com. HIG is an uh, acronym for Hamrick Investment Group. And I'll spell it out for you. It's H-I-G investor, I-N-V-E-S-T-O-R.com. And uh, you, they, you also check out my podcast. It's, and you're going to be a guest on it uh, soon here. It's the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, uh, which I host for the Rental Property Owners Association. Uh, that's great. Well, Brian, just want to say thanks so much for taking the time today and uh, sharing your success with us. Thank you very much, Seth. It's been a pleasure and, and congratulations on your show. I think you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much. It, it uh, means a lot. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well on your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.